Welcome to our show, a collaboration between Percy Sharma and Montgomery. And the theme, a battle between the ancient Egyptians and the Tudors. We are going to make them go head to head to see who is the best. To decide who is the overall victor, we will have five rounds. Each class has a different theme and these are as follows. Round one, who are the best rulers? The pharaohs or the old English kings or queens? Round two, who made the best art? The ancient Egyptians with their wall paintings or the Tudors with their portraits and etchings. Round three, who had the best religion? The ancient Egyptians with their thousands of gods and goddesses or the Tudors with their constant flip-flopping between one church and another. Round four, who wore the best clothing, jewelry and makeup? The ancient Egyptians and the exotic look of icons like Cleopatra or the austere presence of King Henry VIII and the Queen Elizabeth I. And finally, round five, who had the best architecture? The ancient Egyptians with their vast pyramids or the Tudors with their rugged castles. At the end of each round, we'll take a vote. And at the end of the show, We'll announce the overall winner. Right, let's get started with our first round. Who were the best rulers? Before we get started, can we just get something clear? What exactly do we mean by best rulers? Do we mean the kindest, most fair leaders of men and women? You know what? I don't think either side will get a lot of votes for having the kindest rulers. Yep, yep, good point. So what do we mean then? Hmm, how about the most interesting? The rulers with the juiciest stories and the wildest personalities. Okay, fine. That works for us supporters of the Tudors. We have so many crazy stories about our kings and queens who ruled England between 1485 and 1603. Well then, why don't we start at the beginning with the first Tudor king, Henry VI. The Tudors were exciting from the get-go, their stories steeped in blood and lust for power. Henry seized the throne when he defeated Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 AD. Ugh, power and violence. That's all the pharaohs knew too. Constantly battling to earn respect, expand the territory of their empire, and to seize other people's things. At that time, as well as the Egyptians, there were many great civilizations competing to be the most powerful in the known world, including the Assyrians, the Sea People, and the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Britain was just a damp and miserable island in a far off undesirable corner of the world. While the Tudors took the battle for power so seriously that Elizabeth I kept her own cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, in prison for 19 years and finally had her head chopped off in 1587. She didn't want to take any chances of someone else laying claim to the throne. Elizabeth I's sister, also called Mary, was no angel either. Nicknamed Bloody Mary, she ruled England for only five years, but in that time, around 280 people were banned at the stake for not converting to a religion as well as them. How intolerant! Well, the story of Egypt's most famous female pharaoh is interesting for other reasons. Cleopatra was regarded as one of the most beautiful women in all the world, but her story is a very tragic one. First of all, she was made to marry her brother. Ew! That's 
I know, but people throughout history have been prepared to do awful things in order to keep their power. Perhaps Cleopatra's family thought this would be the best way to make sure the power of the empire was all kept in the family. Don't worry though, she killed him so she and her son could rule together. Besides, Cleopatra already had two boyfriends, the Roman rulers Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. These were two of the most powerful people in the known world. However, legend has it that Cleopatra eventually ended her life by committing suicide by letting a poisonous snake bite her. You see? Her empire was about to be taken over by another Roman emperor called Octavian and she didn't want to live a life of humiliation, seeing her beloved empire being ruled over by the Romans. That's pretty sad, but did you know that Henry VIII had six wives? Oh, for goodness sake, everyone knows that. Of course, because it's such an interesting fact. He married six times, one died, he divorced two of them, and chopped the heads off another two. The only one who got off lightly was his last wife, Catherine Parr, who outlived him. Okay, I admit it, that is pretty crazy. But can we move on, please? But did you know he created a new religion because of his wives? Ooh, what do you mean? Well, he split England from the Catholic Church and the Pope because divorce was not allowed under the Catholic Church. Yes, that is right. And then he created the Church of England so that he could divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Did you know Henry also passed laws to merge England and Scotland? And he was the first English king to be king of Ireland. I heard King Tut had a big beard. Huh? Yeah, a fake beard. He was only 10 years old when he became feral, so he wore a fake beard to appear more mature than he really was. He was nicknamed the Boy King. Okay, okay, so it's Boy King and Tragic Woman versus Murderous Queen and Rule Breaking Kings. Yep, it sounds fair to me. Let's see what the people think. It's the ancient Egyptians versus the Tudors. Wow, what a knockout. The Tudors there with a fantastic win. Next match is a battle of art. Again, between ancient Egyptians and the Tudors. Who do you think is going to win? They're too evenly matched to tell. But But let's find out! Clearly the ancient Egyptians are the greatest. Just look at their art. What? You have no common sense. You must be an ancient Egyptian mummy because you had your brains removed by an embalmer. Just look at the two that are. It's vastly superior. Must be mad as Ophelia in that Shakespeare play. What was it called? Hamlet. Ah, yes. One of the greatest plays in the English language. And it was written in Tudor times. I think you'll find that was written in Elizabethan times. You see, you don't know what you're on about. Look at the Sphinx in Giza. It's still standing today after 4,500 years. Proof of how well it was made, and it's even still popular today. Its body is 60 meters long and 20 meters tall. Its face is a whopping 4 meters wide. It's an incredible sculpture. <laughs> Isn't that the one that lost its nose? Oh, come on now. It's over four and a half thousand years old. You've got to expect a bit of wear and tear. And just consider how imaginative it is. Built for the Pharaoh Cafe. This stone sculpture has the head of a woman and the body of a lion. 
Legend has it that the Sphinx used to ask a riddle of any travelers who passed her way. If the riddle was answered incorrectly, she would eat them. Well, I suppose if you're easily impressed by things that are big stories about silly made up creatures, then the Sphinx is for you. But if you are looking for something a little more sophisticated, I suggest you try the Tudors. They created clever symbols such as the Tudor Rose, a great early example of graphic design. It combined the white rose of the Lancaster family and the red rose of the York family. What? Oh my gosh, that's nothing. The ancient Egyptians had their own symbols more than 5,000 years before that, called hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics use over 137 pictograms and logographs to create a unique and visually stunning language. Picto and logo, what? Basically, simple symbols. Simple? Sounds about right. That's nothing compared to the complex work of Hans Holbein. Not only did he paint many Tudor monarchs and aristocrats, but he also created many etchings of dramatic scenes. His famous Dance of Death series of etchings showed that no one, neither rich nobleman nor poor peasant, could escape the final fate of all human death. These etchings show death personified as dancing skeletons. A chilling reminder of how fragile life could be, but also reminding us that we are all equal before the eyes of God. Death? What did the Tudors know about death? Ancient Egyptian death masks were created so that the soul would recognize the person's body in the afterlife. For rich people of high status, these death masks were often made of precious materials such as gold and gems. The death mask of Tutankhamun is a great example of this. The Tudor wealthy people also had fantastic examples of art. If you were rich enough, you could afford to get a breathtaking portrait of yourself in vivid colours, and some of them were enormous. Many, many, many. Is that all you Tudor cheerleaders think about? The Egyptians didn't even have money. Yeah, but they were hardly humble people. Just look at those pharaohs and the way they kept covering everything in gold. Hmm, I think this is another one of those occasions when neither side comes across looking that great. Hmm, maybe it's best to both sides. Just concentrate on the actual art. Rather than thinking about who made and why. Hmm, okay, agreed. And on that basis, the Tudors are clear winners. What are you crazy? Please, ancient Egyptians! Ha ha ha. Oh, really? I can't wait to see the look on your face when the votes go our way. As if. You must be joking. the ancient Egyptians. Did you think that was going to happen? Of course they were going to remember their statues and pyramids, duh. So what's next on the agenda? Religion. Religion? Such a fascinating subject. Just think how many different faiths have existed all around the world and in every era of humankind. Throughout history, we've seen how religion can inspire and liberate people, but also how it's been abused by those who wish to discriminate and persecute others. Yes, it's really true. It hasn't always been this way, but thankfully, these days we live in a tolerant society. People are able to express their views freely without fear of ridicule. Agreed. In fact, the only opinion that is undeniably ridiculous is the thought that the religion of the Tudors is better than that of the ancient Egyptians. Oh my gosh, here we go again. Not more nonsense from your side. 
How can a religion that has over 2,000 gods and goddesses be worth following at all? Gods and goddesses such as Seth, Isis, Anubis, Nu, Osiris, Bastet, and Rey. The list goes on and on and on and on. How could anyone ever keep track? You know, there should be a limit on the number of deities a religion is allowed. Best to keep it simple, just like the religion of the Tudors. One God, simple. Simple? If the Tudor religion was so simple, how come they were always fighting over it? Catholicism one year, Protestantism the next. The Tudors change religions more often than they change their other parts. Although to be fair, mm, that wasn't very often. Hey, no need to get personal. Besides, who cares if they swing around a lot? It just makes things a bit more interesting. Not if you are a Catholic priest having to hide from persecution during the reign of Elizabeth I or a Protestant worrying about to being burned at the stake under the reign of Bloody Mary. Well, the ancient Egyptians had their fair share of bloodshed too. They also had the bumblebee idea that their pharaohs were half human, half god. Imagine giving one person all that power. That's pretty corrupt. What? Hardly as corrupt as the Tudor Catholic Church. I can't believe it. They actually told people they could pay money to get into heaven. They called these donations indulgences. Just imagine a religion so corrupt that they convinced people that you could have more chance of getting into heaven just because you were rich. Well, the perks of being rich under the ancient Egyptian religion were far far greater. For example, it was quite common for the servants to be killed if their families died. That way it was believed that the servant could continue to serve their feral master in the afterlife. Oh, what were they thinking? Well, Henry VIII was so selfish, he created a whole new branch of Christianity called the Church of England just so he could divorce one of his wives. The head of the Catholic Church, the Pope, denied Henry's request to have his marriage annulled, which is a fancy way of saying disqualified. But Henry just went ahead and did it anyway, basically by making his own religion. Well, better to make up your own religion than by following the nutty ancient Egyptian one. There's nothing nutty about a religion that lasted for thousands of years. Well, let's see what the people think. They do have the final say after all. Well, at least on that we can agree. The ancient Egyptians versus the children. The debate continues. It's over to you. Competition anymore? Well, there are still three more rounds. Anything could happen. And next up, fashion. Ooh! Fashion, fashion, fashion. Okay, this one's easy. Clothing, jewelry, and cosmetics were definitely, definitely, definitely better in the Tudor times. Are you serious? Look at the ancient Egyptian jewellery, it was fabulous. They wore things like gold bracelets, necklaces and earrings. The amulets were so precious to them too. They wore these things to bring them good luck. What? That's nothing. Check out the Tudor royalty. They really knew how to bling it up. They had jewellery covered in rubies and diamonds. What about cosmetics, also called makeup? The Egyptians loved it. So much so, in fact, that even the men wore it. 
They use coal to draw thick, distinctive black lines around their eyes and used a kind of lipstick and special eye makeup. Well, rich Tudors wore makeup too. Queen Elizabeth I used to use thick white makeup on her face. Because she was so important and influential at that time, people used to copy her and became a fashion craze. Wearing makeup in the Tudor times was a sign of wealth and status. It is also rumoured that people used it to cover up their scars from smallpox. What about clothing? Egyptian clothing was not only beautiful but practical too. It was mostly made of linen, the perfect material for hot climates. It kept the wearers covered but not too hot. Such variety too. Egyptian clothing included kilts, skirts, cloaks, shawls, and some dresses. Many of the Egyptians went barefoot, but the rich were shown with sandals that are made with leather. Poor people wore sandals made of woven papyrus reeds, which were a kind of straw. The Egyptians were so clever to make shoes out of papyrus. The Tudors could never do that. Ha ha ha, what? Is that the best you can do? Look at all the crazy Tudor fashion like ruffs. This large pleated collar was worn by both men and women. Both genders also wore tights. It might look strange today, but it was normal back then. Rich men wore white silk shirts, frill at the neck and wrists. Over this did wear a doublet, a bit like a tight-fitting jacket and a close-fitting striped trousers. Tudor women wore fantastic-looking floor-length ball gowns that were embroidered with gold. The Tudors would wear white clothing to make themselves look fatter. This made them believe they were richer because they had more food to eat. Okay, okay, I admit. That was kind of interesting. But overall, ancient Egyptians clearly knew what was best when it came to one's appearance. Their style was so mysterious and created such iconic looks such as the death mask they designed for their pharaohs. Even after they had died and had been embalmed, they were still buried with their dazzling jewels and amulets. Just look at how fabulous Tutankhamun's death mask was, full of gold. Between Henry VIII, the Tudor leader, and Cleopatra, the Egyptian leader, we have to admit that Cleopatra was just much more of a fashion icon. What? You are nuts. The Tudors were fashion heroes. The ancient Egyptian was zero. Blah, blah, blah. Are you kidding? Well, we'll just have to see about that, won't we? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. We will have to see what our listeners think first. So, who wins the fashion contest? The ancient Egyptians or the Tudors? It's up to you to decide. to a one-sided game. Why aren't the Tudors fighting back? Well, they have one more chance. Can they win? It's architecture. Hmm? Architecture? You know what? I have never heard of these strange words. You've never heard of architecture? Architecture? Oh, I know what that is. That's when the aliens landed from space all the way to Earth. Ha! I call you red-handed! That's not architecture! Look, 
You don't even know what architecture even is. Guys, 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 relax. Let me tell you. Architecture is the design of buildings. From ancient Egyptians and the amazing pyramids. To the gruesome Tudors and their superior castles. To nowadays the skyscrapers, sturdy houses, flats and factories. Hang on guys, have you not realised? Hold on, what? We can totally debate on castles versus pyramids. Tudors versus ancient Egyptians. Well, let me start. The pyramids are only that big because the pharaohs made hundreds of slaves toil day and night over years and years to build them. How can you love something that was built on the poor backs of the unpaid slaves? Actually, that's a myth. Historians don't think it was slaves who built the pyramid. Besides, all those huge Tudor castles were only ever owned by kings and queens or lords and ladies who treated their subjects just as badly. Guys, guys, perhaps both sides can agree that neither of us are going to win this argument, especially if it rests on how kind the rulers were. Okay, fair enough. Why don't we just focus on how the structures looked instead and just look at what the ancient Egyptians built. It wasn't just pyramids, you know. They also built temples, palaces, tombs and fortresses with beautifully decorated stone columns. These columns and the surfaces were often engraved with inspiring images such as gods and goddesses. Well, Tudor castles weren't just more beautiful, they were also more comfortable. Hampton Court, Henry VIII's favourite residence, bed no expense. It had glittering painted red brick with a black diamond pattern, white mortar joints and dozens of decorative chimneys. The largest collection in England. Ha! That was just a big party house dedicated to an angry bloated king. The pyramids and temples of ancient Egypt were dedicated to something a bit more important. The gods and goddesses. Have you not heard of the globe? Where Shakespeare, the world's most famous writer, wrote and acted in some of his most loved plays? Well, of course we don't know much about ancient Egyptian buildings. They're thousands of years older than Tudor ones. The first pyramids were built in 2630 BC. That's two and a half thousand years before the first Tudor king. Oh, yawn, there you go again, banging on about those big yellow lumps of sand in the middle of the desert. Actually, the pyramids were made out of bricks, just like your ugly Tudor castles. Well, Tudor castles had moats, battlements, portcullises. Did the pyramids have those? No, but they did have secret chambers where the pharaohs were buried and they were filled with precious jewellery, golden statues and other riches. Tell me, did any Tudor buildings have that? No, but they were still better. Rubbish! And I'm sure we will get the most smoke. Ancient Egypt for the win. Mm, I can't wait to prove you wrong. Tudors for the win. Listen, 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 guys. It's not up to you at the end of the day. It's up to you guys at home. Castles or pyramids? What's it going to be? You decide. 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 Row, are they playing Connect Four? There's nothing the Tudors can do now. The ancient Egyptians have sealed the win, sealed it as tight as a sarcophagus. Congratulations, Congratulations to the ancient.